Um, yeah, so uh, I want to talk about uh, the relationship between winter ticks and moose and talk about a little study my students did. Um, and, and talk about the impact of ticks on moose. And uh, it's a serious one. It's a very serious one. Um, ticks are moving north. Um, about two decades ago, they reached Isle Royale and Lake Superior, um, an island on the north side of Lake Superior. We didn't think they'd get there, and they did. And they're having a huge impact on moose populations. And they're having a huge impact on perhaps not our moose population here, and I'll tell you why later, but certainly in Vermont, New Hampshire. Um, this is the next wave of, of mortality for moose. So uh, ticks, the ticks we have, moose ticks, winter ticks, uh, we call them hard ticks. Uh, kind of gruesome looking, right? Um, they're part of the uh, arachnid family, arachnids. Um, includes the mites and ticks and, and things like that. Um, this is just a, 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 a little figure schematic that looks at the difference between male and female ticks. So they have this kind of sack-like leathery appearance and their heads um, in their body and abdomen are fused together so they're not like ants or bees where you can see the head, the thorax and the abdomen, they're all joined. And the one on the left is a male. So it has white markings on uh, a reddish brown background, these black areas, not that it's color shown. The females are a little bit different. Uh, they're reddish brown, they're all reddish brown. So that's what they look like as uh, adults. Um, they go through a number of larval stages. And I'll go through the cycle of that in a minute. So um, they start off as larva and they ascend vegetation um, and then they hop on a moose. Um, they take a meal as a nymph. These are six legged and then they become eight legged, four pairs. So they ascend vegetation as a larva uh, late August, September, sometimes later than that. Uh, hop on a moose kind of the school bus, and uh, they take a blood meal, become nymphs. This is an engorged nymph there, it's taking a blood meal. Uh, later in the winter, uh, takes another blood meal, there's an engorged one there, becomes uh, an adult. Um, adults take uh, a blood meal near the end of the winter, uh, and this is a female that's engorged. Um, so this is a female that's engorged. She's taken her last meal on the moose. Each time they change the larval stage, they take a blood meal. So this gives you a perspective. Uh, this is a centimeter. Um, so this is roughly the width of your fingernail or your thumb at the end. And probably the length is about two centimeters, small grade. Um, so that's the change uh, the life stages on, on a moose. And um, so this engorged female, uh, just the way it is there, she's holding uh, in her abdomen about one milliliter of blood. They're like little vampires. And um, so that's about one cubic centimeter of, of fluid. And so she's holding that. Um, so there's a good shot of a male, you can see the white and the red, and there's a female, although it's a small one, and this is her engorged. So their abdomen um, can swell a lot and pick up blood. So each time they change from stage to stage, they take a blood male, and the males and the females, more so the females, take a huge amount of blood out of a moose. And we'll talk later on about how many are on a moose and it's astronomical. So there's a shot. The black line is the distribution of, of moose in, in North America. And the little, this color here is now the distribution of 
uh, winter ticks are moose ticks. So it's moved substantially north. And, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, it's now on IRL. They never used to have them. They keep moving north. And you're probably saying, boy, moose, moose go way up in, in Canada. And let's just say moose are not inhibited by cold. They don't care. All they need is food. They can go to the Arctic, but there's not enough food. As long as there's food, they'll be there. So they're not inhibited by cold temperatures. They are by warm temperatures. Above 60 degrees, not good for moose. Males just conk out and go in water, just lie down. So global warming, climatic change. Yes, sir. Steve, what's the little mountain, I assume that island in uh, Alberta? Yeah, and I, could, I, could, I was looking at that. It's got to be a mountain range or something, yeah, right? Yeah, it is. Oh, I, uh, north of... Um, yeah, and I couldn't the remember. Water, yeah, I know. Waterton. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, the park. Yes, okay. yes, yeah. The other side of Glacier. So uh, the three main hosts of winter ticks or moose ticks, uh, and this is in Western Canada, are obviously moose, uh, elk, and white-tailed deer. Um, so those are the three uh, hosts for uh, this tick. And so this shows the life cycle um, of winter ticks. And they're interesting because they're one host ticks. They hop on the host, develop on the host, and stay on that one beast and then drop off at least the females. Most other ticks go on two or three different hosts and take blood meals. So this, this is an interesting one. And it's one that occurs probably in the worst season of the year over the winter. So I'll, I'll start with one stage. So the females, the engorged females drop off in probably June or March or April, they drop off they go under the leaves, uh, produce three or four thousand eggs, uh, develop and hatch in end of August, beginning of September. They develop into larvae, which ascend vegetation, and just hang there as a group. And I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, so they kind of look like hockey pucks in trees or brushes, kind of big clumps of things in, in the thing. So moose, unsuspecting moose, either looking for food or the bulls in the rain season are bumping into these and all these little uh, larvae are hopping on uh, the moose. So in October, November, the larvae feed, they molt and change to a nymph. Uh, October, March, uh, and then later on, the nymphs feed again and become adults. And uh, later in March and April, the, now the last meal the females have taken uh, drop off and the females lay the eggs on the ground, they burrow and then lay the eggs. So that's the cycle over the, over the, the, the summer or over the year. And so it's a, it's a unique one. So they feed on the same host, which is different from other ticks. So, I think you'd be astounded by the number of, of ticks that are on moose, um, but what is interesting um, is the larva actually climb to the right height to hop on an animal, whether it's white-tailed deer, elk, or moose. So they climb vegetation in late September, early October, and they prefer to stay about one to two meters above the ground. So they go to the right height, which is interesting, right? And uh, I found out today they stay on the leeward side of branches to get out of the winds and the cold. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah that's just, yeah, I'm, I'm astounded. But. And uh, the larva can detect a number of, of things. Uh, they can uh, sense the heat from an animal. Um, and I haven't listed it there, but movement of the branches and the animal, and carbon dioxide, your breath, the most breathing. So as soon as they get those triggers, they become alive. So you don't see them, they're just kind of dead, and they come alive. And so this was interesting. Um, let's start with this one right here. So winter ticks, moose ticks know exactly which height to form uh, clumps. 
to get the best chance of hopping on a, the shoulder of a deer, uh, shoulder of an elk or a moose. So, uh, so both chest height of a deer, shoulder height of a mouse. And so what they did, they took little things of, of ticks, and then they had a plastic bar running up and down. And if you can see this one right here, this is um, high magnification to see where they're clumping on this pole, this plastic pole. Uh, so the nylon rods that you see here, and these are full of ticks, I know, what a way to go, right? Um, they simulated vegetation, and the larva would climb, and they found out that 80% of the 400 clumps that they found on these rods um, were at heights between 50 centimeters and 190 centimeters, which is the height of moose, and 50 centimeters, the height of deer. The average was about 125 centimeters. So winter ticks climb vegetation to the height of their hose, which is unique, right? Which is absolutely incredible when you think about it. They know which height to go to to hop on. And so that's a clump right there. And they're not moving, but you touch them, they will be moving and they all hop on. And this is a figure on the left, the, the pinkish thing is someone's finger. And they've actually touched the ticks on vegetation. And their legs are like Velcro. When you get one, they bring all their friends. And so they swarm the animal. They don't come by one by one, they bring all their friends to the party. And we're talking thousands, we're not talking a few, we're talking thousands. So again, um, just going back to the life cycle, we have the eggs. Uh, they send the vegetation that has larvae, six-legged, three pairs, and then they hop on the moose and take a blood meal and become nymphs and then uh, go through the, uh, the cycle. Uh, these are males, and so it gives you pr perspective of the size. Um, and the females are going to be substantially more uh, engorged with, uh, with the ticks. Um, numbers can be astronomical. In fact, they can be so numerous they look like shingles on a roof. Uh, I've seen some in Ontario that look like someone took green grapes and draped them on the backs of the animals. Um, and ticks are sloppy eaters, especially the females. So they can hold about one milliliter, but they probably process three to five. And that's a lot of blood. That's a lot of blood. So they're like little kids, kids that are sloppy eaters and things like that. So they process a lot. They're not very efficient. Uh, this is a moose in the winter time. So this is a moose bed. And you can see over here, this is a moose is stepped and you can actually see the ticks that have come off. So, of course, in the winter time, uh, usually at night or in the evening, the moose bed down. Um, but you can see on this moose bed, there's a lot of blood. Um, it's probably dried blood from tick feces. So in their feces, there's a lot of blood. They don't process it well, really well. Some of the females uh, that have dropped off have big gaping wounds. So there's blood coming off that. And then live ticks that have been crushed like grapes. So this is pretty significant. This is pretty significant. Um, so females require a lot more blood than male ticks because they develop their eggs. So when they drop off, they need the blood. That's their last meal. And they need the energy to uh, develop their eggs anywhere from three to 4,000. And as I mentioned, um, they become quite large, uh, at least two centimeters in length and about a centimeter wide or wider, and they hold about one milliliter of blood. Um, they drop off their, the, the host, they burrow into the soil, and then lay their eggs. Kind of hideous looking, right? And I'm going to show you this. This is an interesting one. This is from a, a study from the Canadian Journal of Zoology and one that hits home. The 
this is uh, a study on moose calves in New England, Maine, and um, in uh, what am I, is it New Hampshire, or Vermont? Anyways, um, so they looked at moose health over several years in New Hampshire and Maine, and the study identified 125 calves that died from 214 to 216, and they found out the tick infestations caused nearly 90% of their deaths. So it's having a huge impact on calves. And they also impacted female adults, so they have fewer calves and decline uh, calving rates. So what they found overall is there was a 70% uh, mortality of, of calves over that period compared to 15% several decades earlier. So ticks are having an impact on, on those. Um, it's more important on young animals because they're growing and they need twice as much ener energy as an adult. Um, an animal, a mammal, 8% of its body weight or mass is blood. And with high tick numbers, those ticks can take all the blood out, but they have to regrow it. So the cost of replacing your blood um, is astronomical. So it's taking all the energy away from the moose, especially the young ones. So it's, it's a crisis. It's a crisis that's coming. Uh, it got a little better thereafter, but um, it's going to get worse. As it gets warmer, shorter winters, it's going to be worse. It's, it's advantageous for the ticks. Okay, so we saw that. So, we're pretty sure that moose populations have been infected by ticks since the early part of the last century. So they've been around for a bit, but they're probably more widespread now and increasing um, as we go north. Uh, blood loss is substantial, as I just indicated, um, especially with high tick numbers. Um, but there's more to it than that. That's only one problem. Um, high tick numbers cause intense irritation on the moose. And instead of eating, they spend their whole day grooming and rubbing against trees and vegetation and wear their fur off. So it's not good being in the wintertime and taking your parka off. It's cold. You're losing energy. You're not eating. Um, at the end of winter, not a lot of food. Putting them in jeopardy. So a lot of hair loss, and we'll talk about this in a minute, um, exposed to extreme temperatures. So they're using more energy when they lose their, their fur. And as I indicated, probably warmer, shorter winters uh, will contribute to higher numbers of ticks. So that's what Vermont, New Hampshire are experiencing now. And we periodically are experiencing this. You know, when we get the more rains than what there used to be, in mild temperatures. So. Uh, this is an old thing. This is the way they used to look at the uh, effect of ticks on, uh, on moose. And they look at the damage of the hair. So this is, this is an old thing. Um, this is a normal moose. This is a little bit of damage on the shoulder. It's probably against trees and vegetation. This is moderate. And this is severe damage. And this is what we call ghost moose. And moose hair is pretty long on the hackles and the shoulders and the back, it's about eight inches. And it looks black, but close to the skin, it's actually white. So they rub it off, and close to the skin, it's all white, so we call them ghost moose, because they look white. Uh, but in the wintertime, there's no thermal insulation there. And so they gotta crank up the temperature, use their energy to keep warm. So they're taking a blood meal, they're becoming anemic, uh, they have to replenish their blood supply. Uh, I mean, a big bull moose, 8% of body weight is 30 liters of blood. 30 liters of blood is a lot. It's a big volume. And if they have to regenerate that or regrow it, that's a lot of energy. And then they've lost their parka or their fur coat. Uh, this is some males on a hide, just to give you a perspective. Uh, you can see some of the hair loss here. 
So this is later in the winter, but it gives you a perspective of, of them. This is another one with a few more. Uh, and I've seen a lot worse than this. I've seen one that looks like some of those great green grapes over the back of a, of a male. So the females are gone. Uh, as I mentioned, they're very sloppy eaters. Um, so they process a lot. There's a lot of dried blood in their feces. There's lesions, open wounds on the skin. Sometimes they rub the, skin, the fur right off. And that's even more worse. So it um, could be a, an opening or conduit to bacteria or viruses and, and things like that. In fact, you can see a couple male ticks in here hiding. So, so high tick numbers, um, the moose stop feeding, uh, causes a lot of ir irritation on them. Uh, they spend most of their days grooming and not feeding. And late winter, not a lot of food out there. They're thin, probably starving, and they're not eating. So their health is going to decline. And again, it's hardest on the calves because they need twice as much energy as an adult of the same mass or weight. So by not eating, a moose will not meet its energy requirements. Um, and that's why we're having die-offs. Um, we're having die-offs in most moose populations, not here, but in all other places, Michigan, Southern Ontario, Northern Ontario, New Brunswick, um, Wisconsin, all those areas that have moose populations are declining and they're really worried. Um, we seem to be okay so far. We seem to be okay. Uh, this is a study from out west, and um, it's a study of captive moose. And anyways, they have um, the, let me get this right, they have 13 captive moose that they've infested with winter ticks. Okay, so it's the square colored ones right here. And then they have 11 uh, with no ticks. And so they measured how much time they were grooming during the, um, the day. And we can see here late winter that the tick infested moose spend most of their day or most of their time grooming, whereas the, the other deer spend time eating. And that's significant. That's significant. You're not spending your time to get food. And uh, so they're in a, essentially a negative energy budget. And again, it's even worse for, for young animals. So again, they have to replenish their blood. Uh, they're spending all their time grooming, uh, rubbing, losing their coat, hard to thermoregulate, uh, and not eating. All the ingredients to not surviving over the winter time. Um, they, become, they can become anemic, which means they don't have enough red blood cells. Not enough red blood cells, not carrying enough oxygen. Uh, there's other physiological effects too. They lose their mass and their fat and things like that. They damage uh, their winter coat uh, because they're grooming, trying to get rid of the ticks. Um, most animals try and lay down some fat before the winter because it's going to be lean, right? It's going to be a tough winter and put down some fat because it's a high energy rich food or storage food. So during this time they're losing it all. Uh, they're grooming, they're not eating. They become very uh, restless. They can't sleep very well because of the irritation. And as I mentioned, it's, it's most significant on, on young animals because they need the energy. And they don't have a big mass and they don't have a lot of fur, and they cool relatively easy, so the temperatures are even more important on them. So we did a little study here in uh, 2005, and at that time, um, you know, we didn't know much about the ticks up here. Uh, so we just wanted to see whether they were on the moose and maybe uh, get a relative indice of, of tick numbers up here. So this is a student project. Um, so we wanted to, to look again are the here and, and numbers on, on moose in northern Maine. 
At that time, it was in collaboration with the Maine Medical Research Institute, Vector Born Diseases. And so uh, we had teams of students, and um, during this semester and the last 16 years in my wildlife science, wildlife management, uh, during each week of the hunt season, uh, the students uh, don't have to come to class or labs and spend their, all their time down at the Ms. Check Station collecting data. And so uh, we had teams of students doing uh, tick surveys at the uh, Moose Tagging Station. Formerly it was at the Redemption Center on West Main uh, Street. Um, we used a big comb to separate the fur. They have really thick fur. And so we would separate the fur and look at the fur and look for, for ticks for about five minutes in the neck and shoulder area. And when we first started, we, we did a six by six inch area on the neck or shoulder. Uh, we were just starting out, we just wanted an indice of stuff. Uh, we would remove ticks with forceps as close to the skin as possible, and that's the way the vets tell you in the hospital. Yeah. Um, all the ticks from that moose were put in uh, one vial. Uh, we also put a one drop of water in the vial to keep the animals alive and then they would be sent down to the uh, southern Maine for processing. Um, we had data sheets where we recorded the uh, tag number, hunter's name, contact information, date, time killed, when we examined the animal. Uh, the town, the sex of the animal, the age, and number of ticks on data sheets. So you can see the comb here. Now you can see the skin. Uh, there's another shot. And these are the ticks in the vial. So this was a preliminary study. Uh, these were the materials that we use. I um, made sure the students wore disposable gloves, surgical gloves. Um, not so much worried about moose ticks but we don't know what they carry, but I was more worried about deer ticks. So they're also on the moose, so I wanted to be very careful of that. Several large combs, forceps, uh, vials. Uh, we had magnifying glasses, we didn't need them. Uh, males and females are like big watermelon seeds. Um, so I can actually, I actually have one in an old one here that I found on the ground. So it's probably a female that dropped off was engorged, dropped off, laid her, laid her eggs, and now she looks like a big raisin. So this is an adult female, if you want to pass that around, so it's all shriveled up. So it's not engorged, if it was engorged, it'd be like a grape. But it gives you a perspective of the size. And then we have the tick data sheets that we would collect all the information. So there's a, a male. And you can see the white markings and the red lines there. And this is from uh, the students that did it this week. Um, they actually use categories, uh, numbers of ticks per move. So they had a category in that area of 0 to 5, 6 to 10, 11 to 15, 16 to 20, and 21 to 30. Uh, first week, uh, when we first started, there was only a two week season. Now we have three weeks. Uh, two bulls and then uh, a cow season now. In those days, we just had, I believe, the two bulls and had some cows. So um, in this range, um, there were 22 bulls that had this range for this. So we, we observed the first week 26 bulls, found 71 ticks. Uh, found there was a couple females, four cows, and only found 14 ticks, so a total of 85 ticks and 30 moose inspected, so not a lot. Um, second week, um, uh, quite a bit more for the bulls, um, and more cows and higher numbers, so a lot more ticks, um, and we had 41 moose that we inspected. So um, we started out six by six, uh, a couple years later we went to a square foot and then thereafter we adopted the, the state system which I'll explain a little later um, and things so. So this is zero to five 
So you can see one tick there. So you can see here it's white near the skin. So when they're rubbing, all the dark fur comes off and it looks white, and that's what we call them ghost myths. Uh, but some of them go right down to the skin. And so when they lose that insulated layer, um, it's hard on them in the winter time. There's six to ten. Uh, some of the white ones look like rice, or actually they've cast their exoskeleton, they've gone from larva to nymphs. Um, there's 11 to 15, not the clearest. There's 16 to 30. Uh, most of the ticks were in the nymph stage. And you can see the four pair of legs, so they look red. Um, not very big, but they're pretty conspicuous. They're pretty easy to see when you're um, doing the, uh, the counts. So we did this study. Uh, I'm not sure if we got a good reflection of numbers on the moose. Uh, we found ticks. Um, and, you know, we probably only looked at a small area and probably looked at an area where there are relatively high numbers. So the neck and the shoulder are usually high numbers. Um, so was it reflective of the old whole animal? Uh, probably not. Um, there were a lot more ticks the second week and we assume that the ticks were still climbing vegetation after the first week. Uh, when it's warm they steam, seem to stay on the ground and as soon as it gets cooler they come up and then the animals are active too. So it may be temperature related or whatever. Um, whether it's having an impact on our moose up here, uh, it's hard to say. Um, I don't think we have the same tick load as other places, and I'll give you a, a comparative study out west in a minute. Um, the one thing we don't know is what they carry. We know what deer ticks carry. Um, winter ticks, moose ticks, we're not sure. That's the one thing we don't know. And there's a little more to the story. There's a peripheral study, and I'll, I'll mention it near the end of this. I think it will astound you. Um, it's a peripheral study to this, and I'll mention it later. How do we manage this? We're not sure. Um, getting ticks off moose is going to be a very difficult thing. Um, you know, the only thing I can think of is some kind of salt licks with something in them that would give them some kind of either immunity or you know, a topical thing that we give dogs or cats or something. That's the only thing I can think of. I'm not, I don't think, you know, the state says we don't have a problem, uh, but it's coming. So another study by Welk and Samuel, 1989. Uh, they actually did a, a unique study and they, they took uh, moose, uh, the head ticks, and they took the hives and they put them in a solution of potassium hydroxide, which means it dissolves the leather and the fur, but not the exoskeleton of the ticks. So they could get a direct count, total count that was on the moose, uh, which is interesting, a little tedious. but um, And so they did that, but they also wanted to figure out if there was an easier way to determine the accuracy of, of counting the ticks rather than the whole hide, is there a better way to actually count the ticks? But it was a really good study. Um, so this is one animal, and this had almost 63,000 ticks. Um, and so we can see these areas, the shoulder and the neck and down to here, are many ticks in the rump. And as we move down the legs, there's none low upper legs, few, and then on the belly and the sides in some places, few. So that gives you a perspective of where most ticks uh, would be found. So they collected 20 moose hides, um, and they found out that just a sample of 15% of the half the hide was enough to get a good estimate of the total ticks on the mouse. So that drastically reduces the amount of investment of time and money and things like that. So, um, Of all the animals they looked at, 214 moose hides, the average number were 33,000. That's a lot. And it gets worse. 
Uh, two thirds had ten to fifty thousand. Nineteen percent had over fifty thousand. Six percent had over eighty thousand. Three percent had more than a hundred thousand. Two most heavily infested moose was a bull with one hundred fifty thousand ticks and a calf with one hundred forty-five thousand. Put it in perspective. That's a density of thirty-seven ticks per square inch for the bull. 50 ticks per square inch for the calf. That's incredible. And, you know, think of them, as half of them are females taking a blood meal. That's going to be a huge uh, blood fest on the, on the animal. It's not going to make it. So numbers are high. I don't think we have those numbers here, but I don't know how accurate we, we were. Um, so I, I think, you know, from their study and our study, I think we have certainly a higher occurrence and frequency of ticks out in Canada, and I know Vermont and New Hampshire have that, as I indicated earlier. Um, so we did a preliminary study, um, and we've kept doing it, um, which is good, but I still think we have a long ways to go. How could we have improved the study? maybe more of the moose hide than just the shoulder area. As I mentioned, we went to a square foot, but we're still in the shoulder neck area. Now we've adopted the state system, and I'll show you uh, in a minute. Uh, maybe spend a little more time surveying the ticks, but hunters come in and want to leave real quick, right? They don't want to hang around. They want to get home and do whatever, so it's kind of hard. Um, maybe determine the area of the moose's hide and get a better uh, reflection of numbers of ticks on the moose. Um, maybe monitor hair loss late in the spring. Uh, they do that in some areas, do burial surveys and get a, an indice for how many animals are suffering of the population. That might be a good indice to see if things are happening out there because, you know, in remote areas, if the animal dies, we're not going to know, right? So maybe doing something like that. So. Uh, I'm trying to initiate a, a new study. I'm going to work with uh, uh, Peter Nelson, Dr. Nelson, on this. He's got some drones. I'm hoping to get some in infrared cameras and put them on drones and look out in Allagash and see the thermal signature of the animals. Uh, the fur loss would indicate different uh, losses of heat, body heat, so um, and things like that. So, hoping to do that kind of work. Um, another thing too is, and we've tried this with um, deer ticks and moose ticks, is what we call flagging. And what it involves is uh, going out in the field and looking at specific habitat and doing surveys for, for ticks. And what it is is a pole with, you know, a square meter or a yard of fabric and going through the vegetation because they hop on it and then counting them. So you can do it by area or you can do it by time. Uh, we have not been very successful. Uh, we have found some deer ticks, uh, very few moose ticks. But it could be that they, they come out of the ground later in the season and we're doing this in the summer. But if we could identify specific habitat, um, that might be something. In some areas, and this is a little bit of a taboo, uh, if you do prescribed burns and burn the forest floor, just the vegetation that kills them. But that's, yeah, in this day and age, it's kind of a tough, tough sell, so. Okay, so let's see. I want to go over. I want to show you what the state does. So the state has a little different system, and we've, we've adopted that. Um, first off, they, they pick four strategic areas, so kind of right behind the, the ears, upper neck, on the shoulder, on the ribs, the abdomen, and then the rump. So they take four areas. And in those four areas, um, they take uh, four 10 centimeter long transects. You take a little rule with 10 centimeters, part the fur, 
and count the number of ticks along that transect or along the line of the furthest thing. And you do four of them in those four areas, so 16 transects or places. So I think that's kind of good because when you think back to that place where I showed this is low, this is high, and things like that. So I think it's a better indice of, of what's on, on, on the animal. So that's where we do it now. It takes a little bit of time. Uh, Hunter's a little bit antsy about hanging around. This is the data sheet that the state uses. Um, so, oops, sorry. So we have the, uh, oops, it's not gonna do it. Okay, let me go back. Okay. Anyways, we, it's not showing up there. The seal number, the time of depth, and things. And these are the four transects in the neck area, the four in the ribs and things. And we just put the number that we see there. And each row is a moose? Yes, each row is a moose. And the number there. And that's the, 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 the way the state is doing that. So it's number of ticks per transect, 10 centimeter transect. It's relatively easy. Um, and the state's been uh, doing that for the last 10, 12 years. Uh, so that's, uh, that's interesting. Well, anyway, Steve, I want to thank you very much for oh, no this. No problem. This is a lot of time and effort. Yeah. We really appreciate it. Well, very, thank, very you for thank you. Thank Great. you for coming. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming.